planted my first sense of kind of disorientation in some ways. And also felt very betrayed. I, if you can't trust your mom and your grandfather and your grandmother, who the hell are you gonna trust? But my salvation in some ways came in two forms. One, the following year, my sophomore year, my English teacher said I was asking too many annoying questions and I should do this thing called journalism. So she sent me to a journalism camp. And what was interesting is I remember writing my first story, you know, and seeing your name. In journalism, we have a thing called a byline, which is your name, you know, by Jose Antonio Vargas. I remember seeing my first article on a piece of paper, in a newspaper, and thinking to myself, wait a second, like, if I'm not supposed to be here because I don't have the right papers, but what if I'm on the paper? <laughs> That was my stupid, naive rationale that maybe so long as I keep writing for paper and have my name there, how can they say I don't exist? You know, I have been a journalist for, ter for 13 years since I was 17, I've been a journalist. I've written for the Washington Post, the New Yorker, Rolling Stone, I've interviewed Al Gore, Beyonce, Mark Zuckerberg. I have done maybe about 800 articles. My name, are, my name is all over Google. I won a part of the Pulitzer Prize. How can they say I don't exist? And journalism, in some ways, was my church. I, um, this kind of non-denominational church where everybody belongs and you get to question not just the what and the when and the where, but also the why and the how. And in some ways, I spent a decade telling other people's stories because I was much too afraid to confront my own. Journalism was a salvation. The second salvation came, frankly, from white people. The first person I ever told that I was undocumented was my choir teacher, Mrs. Denny, because she wanted the choir to go to Japan. And I told her, look, Mrs. Denny, I don't have the right kind of passport. She's like, Psh, we'll get you the right kind of passport. I'm like, no, Mrs. Denny, I can't. No, I can't. And then she finally got it, and then the next day she told the class that we were gonna to go to Hawaii instead of Japan. So she was the first person who found out, and she didn't tell anybody. And then my principal found out, because they're all wondering, wait up, Jose, your GPA is pretty good, you're into this journalism thing, why aren't you applying to colleges? This was in 2000, a year before the DREAM Act, as I'm sure you know, was introduced. So because of Pat, my principal, she found a venture capitalist to send me to college for four years. That's how I got to college for three to four years. Then when I got hired at the Washington Post, now mind you, I spent my entire career lying. I was in the business of telling the truth and I spent my entire career lying about who I was. I kept checking boxes I wasn't supposed to check. Do you know what an I-9 form is when you get hired for something? So I remember first filling that out when I was a, got hired at the San Francisco Chronicle right out of high school. And I remember looking at the form and thinking, all right, I can't check the box that says resident alien because I don't have the green card to show them the number. You know, my grandfather said I shouldn't be shown out to anybody anymore. <laughs> I can't really check the US citizen box because at the bottom it says very clearly that it's a crime and you know, there's like years in court or in jail or something in the bottom of it. I was 19. The question was, do I want this job or do I not want this job? The question was, am I taking somebody else's spot? Somebody who has those numbers? The question was, wait up a second, if I'm not a US citizen, what if I actually live up to that? What if I just try as hard as I can to be what that is? Because to me, being a US citizen wasn't just a given, you had to earn it. So I kept checking the box. I kept checking the box at the Chronicle, at the Washington Post where I got hired. I remember when I had to cover a state dinner, <laughs> a White House state dinner for the Japanese Prime Minister, and giving my social security number, which was fake, to the Secret Service. All the while thinking that within 10 hours, I was gonna get a call, <laughs> and my editor was gonna look down at me and I have to explain how the yeah. fuck <laughs> did this happen? <laughs> Forget the Salahis, you know, the White House gang crasher. Like, I made it through the White House. And since, you know, it was for the Japanese Prime Minister, while I was in, I just kept bowing and I just kept getting in because I wanted to take notes and, like, interview people, you know? I couldn't keep going like this. And for me, 
there were two things that really kind of broke the camel's back, right? As I like to say. One was watching dreamers, watching young undocumented people who I was following on Twitter and I was friending on Facebook and watching videos on YouTube. I remember being in New York as an editor at the Huffington Post, sitting in my sitting sitting on my cubicle with my headset on, watching a video of these four young people from Miami walk all the way from Miami to Washington, D.C. to advocate for this thing called the Dream Act. Gabby Pacheco was among them. And thinking to myself, how dare I not speak up? The second thing is I was profiling Mark Zuckerberg for The New Yorker, which was I've always wanted to write for The New Yorker since I picked that magazine up and couldn't understand a word of it. You know, it's like this elitist, I'm sorry to say this, but The New Yorker is an incredibly elitist, incredibly, in some ways, insular, but to me, the best magazine there was. And I wanted to write for it. And here I was profiling Mark Zuckerberg for The New Yorker, and at one point, I was interviewing him. I had five days to interview him, and I was interviewing him one day, and we were walking down California Avenue in Palo Alto. And Zuckerberg, by the way, is not like the movie, The Social Network. He's actually a pretty friendly guy. At one point, he turns to me and goes, Jose, dude, like, where are you from? I... <laughs> it was such a simple question, right? Where are you from? Like, I could have just said, I live in New York, grew up in Mountain View, you know. But that wasn't the whole truth. And I, I think I was done in my head. I was like, I couldn't keep doing this. The lies were getting bigger and bigger. I was implicating more and more people. Before my career as a journalist, I was at the height of my career. Before I could have kept going, I needed to talk about this. And to me, talking about this means talking about the fuller story of immigration in America. Getting it out of this Mexican border ghetto in our minds. To me, it's about talking about the facts, you know, facts, that we rarely ever hear about. So here are some, 11.2 billion. People like me paid $11.2 billion in state and local taxes in 2010. Do you ever hear that? Look, the IRS doesn't care whether or not I have papers. The IRS cares whether or not I pay taxes. And I personally have paid so much taxes, I should be a Republican. <laughs> and here in Florida alone, I'm sorry, it's true. Here in Florida alone, unauthorized immigrants like me, they ended up paying $800 million in state and local taxes in 2010. 69 million of that in property taxes, because guess what? Undocumented people own property. And 737 million in sales taxes. Because guess what? When you go to Walmart, they don't care whether or not you have papers, they care whether or not you pay the same exact sales tax, right? Here's another one, 63. 63% of people like me have been in this country for more than 10 years. So we didn't just cross the border yesterday and ended up outside of Walmart. That's really important to keep in mind. 16.6, 16.6 million people like me live in a household that's known a mixed status family. So I'm Filipino, I like to say we're like, like Italians of Asia, sort of, right? We have huge families. I have 20 cousins, nephews, nieces, and grandmothers, just the immediate 20. And out of 20 people, I'm the only one in the entire family who's undocumented. I'm in a mixed status family. So when Mitt Romney starts talking about the illegal alien Jose Antonio Vargas, I have you know voters in my family who are American citizens who are offended by that. That's the story of immigration in America. And here's another one: two million, almost two million undocumented students right now are enrolled in high school and colleges across America. Two million, and I would argue that's a very conservative estimate. Now here's the question: What do you want to do with them? They can't all just mow your lawns and serve your drinks and babysit your kids. What do you want to do with them? So to me, part of what I'm trying to do as a journalist and now as a quote unquote advocate, and let me explain that more later, is go to places to make sure that we're having this conversation and connect the dots between civil rights and immigrant rights. And one of the places that I went was Alabama. 